Hello everyone and welcome to another English with Joseph. Well, today I thought I would spend a few moments talking to you about the subject of alcohol. Whether you love it or hate it, it's one of those things which is a big talking point in the UK. And it's a big talking point, of course, because it's what everyone drinks. The idea of drinking soft drinks, that's how we refer to non-alcoholic drinks, soft drinks, is kind of unknown for certain people. Oh, I'm currently being attacked by a dog here, it seems, barking at me. Uh, anyway, as I was saying, um, yes, soft drinks are not really what you go to a pub for in the UK. Historically, traditionally, pubs... Oh, there's that dog again. Very annoying. Anyway, um, pubs uh, traditionally in the UK were always uh, for drinkers. The idea of going into a pub and asking for a soft drink would be a little bit like going into a mosque and uh, perhaps insulting someone or going into a church and insulting someone. It's something that you just wouldn't do. I remember once, one of the last times I was in Scotland, I went to a bar and I asked the man uh, for a, a mineral water and he told me, oh, we don't serve water, would you like a whiskey? I said, no, I would like a water. He said, um, well, I can give you water from the tap. I said, okay, give me water from the tap. So he gave me water from the tap and I asked uh, for some lemon. I said, could you put some lemon in my water? Because, you know, it's normal if you have a, a water, a mineral water, to have some lemon or some ice. So I asked for the lemon and the man said, what do you think this is? A fruit and vegetable market? <laughs> so that gives you the kind of idea of the way they would see it. Now, I'm pleased to tell you that not everywhere is like that. In fact, if you come to the UK and you go to any city, you'll find a very large chain of pubs called Weatherspoons, and they are there to serve you coffee, they're there to serve you dinner, they're there to serve you anything that you want, okay? So the issue with them uh, is not the same issue as I'm describing here. Weatherspoons and the other large chain pubs will serve you anything and they'll be very happy to do so. However, in the countryside, especially the more rural parts, you will meet the attitude that I've just described. The other thing about alcohol in the UK is that it's very, very heavily regulated. Here in Spain, no one cares, okay? So you ask for a whiskey, the man brings out the bottle, he pours it until you say stop. And if you don't say stop, you get a very large, large glass of whiskey. In the UK, uh, shots of whiskey are very heavily regulated, okay? So wherever you go, you will always get the same amount. Now, I don't know what that amount is, but they have a way of measuring it. They have attachments to the bottles which measure it for them. They also uh, measure beer slightly differently. So, you, go, you want a whiskey. You go to the pub, you say, I would like a single whiskey, which is one shot, or a double whiskey, which uh, is a double. And you can mix it with Coca-Cola or water or something like this, depending on your taste. By the way, America's got a very different system. And in America, it's expected that you give the man who gives you the drink a tip of a dollar or 50 cents. In the UK, that's not 
acceptable. We don't have any tipping system. For waiters we do, and cab drivers. People who bring us food, but certainly not for people who serve us drinks. Anyway, uh, alcohol, yes. Yeah. So, I'm just talking about uh, whiskey. So, again, here in uh, Spain, if you ask for a beer, it'll cost you around one euro and you'll be given a very small glass. If you ask for a beer in the UK, you'll automatically be given a pint, which is a very large glass, and it's heavily taxed, so you'll be paying around six pounds for it, unless you choose something with less alcohol, such as an ale, which might bring the cost down considerably. If you buy alcohol in the supermarket, uh, again, it's usually pint tins that they sell, a can of beer, and again, that's usually uh, measured in pints, and also it's, uh, it's going to be fairly large, but you can get very cheap alcohol if you buy it in the supermarket, very bad quality kind of supermarket, well, very bad quality kind of beer, I mean to say. So, uh, that gives you a very brief idea of alcohol in the UK. Of course, there's a lot more to it, but whiskey, vodka and gin, uh, the, these, uh, the strong alcoholic beverages are referred to as spirits. Spirits. So sometimes when you're in the supermarket, there may be a sign saying spirits or alcohol and spirits or beer and spirits. Why we call it spirits, I have no idea, but we do. Uh, and beer is just known as beer or lager. Okay, so... Uh, the measurements are completely different from anywhere else in Europe. You get a pint of beer served to you in a very large glass, usually. Um, and here on the continent, the glasses are smaller and also much cheaper because it's not taxed. So I hope that gives you a rough kind of idea of alcohol in the UK and indeed how it's served. Oh, here's a tram. Let's sit down and look at the... Barcelona trams. Oh, nice, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so that's a Barcelona tram. And it's important to say that that has nothing to do with the metro system. It's uh, something completely independent. It's rather new. I think the last 10 years or so they built a tram system and it whizzes along. One of the great things about travelling in Barcelona... Oh, there's another one. Let's have a look at this one as well. There we are, another tram, yeah. Yeah, one of the great things about uh, travelling in Barcelona is if you use your ticket... Imagine that you have a 10-journey ticket. If you use it within an hour, twice, you only get charged for one journey, okay? So I use it on the bus at six. I get on another bus at half six. It's one journey. I still have to put my ticket in the machine, but it won't charge me a second journey. Likewise, if I'm on the metro and then I get off and I go on the uh, bus, Again, it knows how it knows and how it knows <laughs> that I used it around an hour ago or how it manages to know that uh, it's a, an hour rather than an hour and five minutes. I have no idea. Anyway, I'm digressing. We were talking about alcohol. So, uh, alcohol in the UK, everyone does. Everyone drinks alcohol unless most people who, perhaps for religious reasons or medical reasons, can't. Let's go down this dark alleyway and see what we can find. Yeah, uh, so I don't, uh, I don't think you should be offended if you come to the UK and someone invites you to the pub, because it's what most people do. If you really don't drink, it's better just not to go, <laughs> because it's no fun watching people getting drunk. 
really it's never fun watching people getting drunk because sometimes they say or do things which are quite embarrassing. Oh, those are nice flats, aren't they? Beautiful. Nice entrance. Avenida de Chile. Mm. Looks like a restaurant, doesn't it? But it's not. It's actually, um, it's actually a very respectable block of uh, apartments. Okay, uh, yeah, so that's really all I can tell you about alcohol. It's grouped together and called spirits, and there's very strict laws. Some parts of the UK, you can... Oh, there's another part of it, a nice reception desk. Isn't it beautiful? Oh, really nice. Uh, yeah, some parts of it, uh, some parts of the UK uh, also have very strict laws concerning times in Scotland. You cannot drink before 12 o'clock in the day unless you're on a train that's crossing the border to England. And also, I think there's exceptions made at the airports. So that's, that's one thing to bear in mind. So if you are one of these people, like many Spanish people are, who like to drink beer at 8 a.m., then Scotland is not the country for you. Some people are often surprised at the fact that we have different laws between Scotland and England. I've been told before, ah yeah, but it's the same country. Actually it's not, and I want to tell you about that now. Scotland and England joined for trading purposes in, I don't know when it was, 16, 1690 was it, 1790? Anyway, many, many years ago. And that's fine, you know, there's no, no problem with that. But uh, what happened was they kept separate laws. And as they kept separate laws, the governments obviously uh, wanted to have an identity in both of their countries. So we have a different education system. We have a different legal system. In Scotland, you can marry younger at 16 instead of 18. Uh, you can also do a crime and uh, the verdict that the judge gives you can be not proven. Let me just repeat that. So, if you're in Scotland, you're guilty, not guilty, or we can't prove it, so you can go free. Whereas in England, you're guilty or not guilty if you've done something wrong. So, Scotland has some very peculiar, very different laws, especially with education as well, where tuition is free for all. Well, for all UK citizens, that is, and people who plan to stay there a long time, not for overseas people. But uh, the, the things like licensing laws for alcohol, um, Scotland is very different because Scotland traditionally had a lot of problems with alcohol. We have more alcoholics than anywhere else. <laughs> well, with the possible exception of Russia because it's bigger. But um, we, we had some problems with uh, the thing. So we passed certain laws to try and restrict its use. England, on the other hand, has some, not very many, 24-hour pubs. Actually, uh, the UK doesn't really do alcohol well. It's never done alcohol well. And uh, it knows that there's a problem. Our government knows. So they, they, they are trying to pass some laws to fix that. One of the laws that they're trying to pass is actually the fact that, uh, uh, as I was saying, sorry, they, they, they know they have a problem with it. So one of the laws that they passed was to allow 24 hour drinking, thinking that, well, if people can drink for 24 hours, they can choose to drink when they want, so they won't be so tense and upset about it. Well, that didn't really work because it just meant people drank more. <laughs> And then there was uh, another thing passed it. Okay, well, let's not let them drink. So in Scotland, we can't drink before uh, 12 p.m. So that just means that we buy it at the supermarket the night before. So uh, Britain's very good at, you know, playing the mother. It's very good at telling you what you can and can't do. And it has some very ridiculous laws sometimes. One of the strangest things I've witnessed happened, uh, I think, two weeks ago, where somebody somewhere decided that 
British television, or at least part of it, should be switched off for um, uh, four hours or five hours one Saturday morning uh, to encourage British people to take exercise. So they told everyone, yep, we're switching the TV off for five hours, go and take exercise. I mean, really, <laughs> as if that's going to make people take exercise. But they, they, they sometimes really become very moral. And if you, if you don't come from a Christian country, you might find that strange. Our media like to pick up on things. I was talking to one of my students the other day about Bill Clinton and his affair with Monica Lewinsky, the girl, the prostitute that he supposedly had uh, sexual relations with and the media weren't really so concerned about Monica Lewinsky but they were more concerned that he lied about it and the headlines were oh, Bill Clinton told a lie Bill Clinton didn't tell the truth about Monica Lewinsky you know but the fact is he had sexual relations with her that part seemed to be overlooked um, our, our media have a way of being very, very moral. Oh, do you hear the dog barking? I'm just sure that it's that same dog that was there a moment ago that was barking at me. Oh well, we'll go and see. Um, so, uh, yes, our, our media are incredibly moral when it suits them. And it's all about, oh, this politician didn't declare... No, maybe we won't. It sounds quite vicious, doesn't it? <laughs> maybe we'll go the other way. Okay, so... Um, we're now just going back the way we came and going to cross the road away from the very bad dog. Uh, yeah, um, I can't remember what, walking faster as I can hear the dog getting louder. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure what I was um, leading up to there in my last sentence, but I was just saying that uh, the, our media, the media in the UK, can be incredibly moral when it suits them. And it's all about that politician told a lie. I mean, who cares, really? <laughs> um, I don't think anyone really cares what they do, especially in their private lives. They seem to, oh, there's another tram just passing there at the top. Uh, they seem to be very, very interested in people's private lives and who they're sleeping with and all these things. It's all incredibly shallow, but I, I don't really understand why it's such a big issue. Um, but uh, if you've ever noticed any of our uh, news items, oh, shall we go this way? Yeah, let's go this way for a moment. Uh, you'll know that there's a big problem there because our media, of course, cannot be regulated. They have a right to free speech. But not everything the media says is correct. Let me give you an example of this week's news. Uh, for a while now, our media have been a bit obsessed with the ISS. The ISS is the International Space Station. It's an American thing. Americans put astronauts on it. One of them recently was British as well. Anyway, um, apparently somebody was watching it and there were some lights flashing. Our media decided, oh, it must be UFOs. That's unidentified flying objects. So, I mean, I mean, they uh, may be right, they may be wrong. I'm a bit cynical, but, well, that's just the way I am. Uh, and, oh, what a nice apartment block there, isn't it? Beautiful. Uh, yes, so, um, <laughs> I'm digressing again the ISS, so they were saying, yes, well, uh, there's some flashing lights, it must be unidentified flying objects, or as they're known as UFOs, that's the correct acronym, and uh, well, um, there was a big story, International Space Station sees UFOs, and what made it worse is uh, the Americans decided to cut the uh, cameras when these lights came. Now, I'm assuming the reason why they did that was because it was a reflection, or it was a meteor, or it was something that we weren't supposed to see. But I, I certainly wouldn't automatically think it's an alien. 
okay? So uh, the media got a bit uh, carried away with the story that getting carried away with something means they exaggerated it a little bit. Okay, so they exaggerated it a little bit. And if that wasn't bad enough, uh, what happened then was uh, NASA, who um, run NASA television, and if you haven't watched that, you should, because the English is beautiful. You would love it, especially if you like technical things. They do live coverage from the International Space Station. So, I think it's uh, nasa.gov is the website. So they, they um, uh, announced that they were going to be stopping one of their uh, ISS programs. That's all they said. I think there's a few ISS live programs. They said, we're going to be stopping the one we do at this time. Now, the media added these things up and jumped to a very wrong conclusion, which was that the ISS was shutting down all of their cameras from the space station. And that was simply not true. They were simply discontinuing one of their programs. Oh, there's that dog again. So basically, uh, the story should have been this. Strange light is seen from one of the windows at the ISS. NASA cuts the camera for technical reasons or maybe something more sinister we don't know. And thirdly, NASA is discontinuing one of its uh, programs about space. But putting these three points together, our media said, oh, NASA hides from us the fact that there's UFOs. And they said NASA has decided this week to close down its live feed amidst fears that British people and American people are watching NASA TV and seeing UFOs. So you can see how quickly our media jumped to the very wrong conclusions. No feeds were being closed down. It was simply a live program. Uh, but our media got it completely wrong. Okay, so I don't know why I started telling you this story. I think it was just to show you the power that the media has over our lives. Anyway, I'm now going to go and avoid the bad dog and go home and have pizza. Okay, so it's been lovely, as always, and let's, uh, let's uh, uh, talk again very soon. Um, I'm busy packing, ready for my move to the UK, but there will be more videos coming. Uh, I just don't seem to have as much time as I have had in uh, recent weeks, but there will at least be a video weekly. Remember uh, that you can easily book lessons with me. It's still the holiday season. I'm still a little bit quiet uh, on italki. Alternatively, you can get me on Facebook, English with Joseph, Twitter, McTaggart J7. Um, please do connect with me uh, or through my website, englishwithjosephblog.wordpress.com. Um, uh, do reach out and say hi. It would be very nice. But please don't leave me a comment on Dailymotion because I don't get to see them. Dailymotion system is rather strange. Um, in other things that I've been doing, I've sorted out my, link to, my LinkedIn account and now my social media accounts all talk to each other. I put something in my blog, it goes to Twitter, it goes to Facebook, it goes to LinkedIn, um, and it bounces through all my social media. So no matter what way you contact me, uh, you should be able to catch me uh, on one of my social media accounts, Google+, Plus, Twi Twitter, Facebook, whatever. Um, yeah, I have to say, at this moment, I realized just how British I am. Did you see that couple kissing there? Very bad, very bad. I have to say, I, when I used to be in the UK, you know, <clears throat> I would see a couple kissing on the train and I would cough at them. <clears throat> to let them know that they shouldn't kiss on the train. But times have changed now, you know, people happily kiss on trains and no one cares. It's a spreading of germs. 
anyway, that's just my personal view. So uh, it's lovely to talk with you all. And let's talk again soon. Have a very peaceful night. Thank you and goodbye.